Hello and welcome to this uh, free open NORA online lecture on public sector communication and new forms of influence. My name is Alexander Buhmann. I am Associate Professor for Corporate Communications at BI Norwegian Business School and Director of the newly formed Nordic Alliance for Communication and Management, or NORA for short. As a cross-disciplinary and regional research group, we bring together communication executives and then researchers from communications and different management fields to discuss the role of communication as a strategic driver of organizational performance and success in a changing world. Today, I'm especially delighted to welcome our academic, newer academic partner in Finland, Dr. Vilma Lumaau, who is a professor at the Veskela University School of Business, and her special guest, uh, Kati Kaliumeki, who is a communications director at the Finnish Tax Administration, and this year's recipient of the prestigious Procom Communications Award. Um, before I hand over to you, Vilma, I just want to uh, briefly highlight our next and last NORA online lecture, uh, which is uh, going to happen on the 19th of November. Here we have uh, professors Finn Franzen, Vinnie Johansen and Jesper Falkheimer today with guests discuss recent research from the Nordics in crisis communication and talk about whether and how there is a dimension, a Nordic dimension to crisis management and relate all this to our current experiences with COVID-19. Finally, I want to thank, of course, our corporate partners, uh, DNVGL, the Research Council of Norway, Orkle, and BI, uh, for supporting us to grow this network and to do these kinds of outreach uh, activities where we do uh, research and, and practice exchange. All right, so without further ado, Vilma, over to you. Thank you very much, Alex. Let's see, I'm going to share my screen. Hope all goes well. And uh, greetings from Jyväskylä, Finland, and I think Kati is in Helsinki, Finland. Um, is everything going on with the sharing okay? I hope so. And let's see that I get it going on. Present. Here we go. All right. Very good. So our topic today is public sector communication and new forms of influence. And uh, if you're wondering, well, what does this have to do with business or what does this have to do with organizations that are not public sector organizations? I would say a lot because partly everybody is facing some sort of uh, public sector communication this fall and also this spring that we had because of the pandemic that's going on. But also on top of that, many of the principles we'll be talking about today actually hold for all kinds of organizations. So no matter what the, what the background of this. I'm especially happy to have Kati today with me because as uh, Alex mentioned, she won uh, the communication act of the year for her team at the tax office. And uh, this is something really unique. They are really doing a fantastic job at communicating to the citizens and to other uh, stakeholders in the public sector, what they're doing, but more on Kati later. So the topic today, public sector communication and new forms of influence. Let's start. How do we define public sector communication then? This is uh, taken from a new book uh, that we have out with Maria Jose Canel on public sector communication. And we see it as goal-oriented communication that takes place both inside the organizations and also among their stakeholders. And its aim, basic aim is just to enable public sector function. And not just anywhere, but within their specific cultural and political settings. And the main purpose is to build and maintain the public good and trust between citizens and authorities. Now, those of you who have worked in public sector organizations ever will say that this is uh, really nice, but nothing to do with the reality. I agree. This is uh, pretty much what public sector communication really looks like. So one way, random messages, unemotional listings of facts, difficult words, the processes remain unclear, what are the organizational challenges they, they come through 
and they are sent often out before employees are informed or the political leaders' whims are understood. And sometimes it tends to even ignore stakeholders' needs. And uh, the purpose is, seems to be just to impress the local media and maintain organizational benefits and attempt to sound important. So with this in mind, I do understand that there is a, a reality check that needs to be done. But let's look at public sector communication and the environment in which we're in. I'd like to start by suggesting um, that our society is a society of foam. This comes from the sociologist Peter Slotebig, and he's thinking of um, how we, every single one of us in today's society, are inside our own communication bubble. And inside this old see-through little soap bubble, in the sense of uh, being all parts of a big foam, dish foam, dishwashing foam, for example, um, we like to think that we're very isolated in the sense that we control whatever streams and feeds come into our little bubble. But at the same time, we are part of a larger foam, meaning that anything that happens in the foam happens in our own little bubble as well. So. In that sense, we're not totally isolated. And I really like this metaphor because it portrays very well how we are both insulated or isolated. And uh, at the same time, we are also part of a bigger society that's going on around us. So in the phone then, who is understood to be an influencer? And this is summarizing not just research, but also some industry reports and uh, latest documents on who is, uh, who is understood to be an influencer. So it seems to be that a person like me is still a very influencing one, meaning that anybody that we perceive to be somewhat similar to ourselves in the sense that we don't really have a secret corporate agenda behind us. We're just you know, happy to share information. Anybody who is found in streams and feeds, so whoever makes it to your special uh, bubble in your phone society, whoever makes it into your well, Instagram or TikTok or Facebook or Twitter feeds, is pretty much influencer. Whoever is parasocially bonding with us. Now, parasocial bonds come from uh, the theory uh, of parasocial interaction and parasocial relationships that stem from radio research from the 70s. And uh, they realized in those times that actually viewers started developing relationships with the hosts of radio programs without really being friends with them. But they started to attribute similar uh, uh, things to those individuals as they would the, to their other friends. And in that sense, um, there was a relationship developed and they became uh, friends, but only one-sidedly, meaning the fan thought of the, of the individual as their friend. But uh, at the same time, this kind of parasocial bonding, and uh, I'm referring here to some research that one of my doctoral students, Hannah Reinikainen, is currently doing on influencers. Uh, we found out that it's actually happening online with, with influencers, so new, new media influencers, so video bloggers or bloggers. So anybody who manages to build this kind of a relationship online is actually an influencer, makes, makes an impact on people. Anybody who is a box turner is an influencer. So somebody who helps you find out the truth about something. So if you're, um, because we're in this phone where lots of messages are sent and lots of uh, opinions abide, there is a constant feeling that we have that we are not understanding or we don't, we don't really see and know everything that we should know. And now anybody who publishes information or reports information that says like the 10 facts about this that you never knew or the 10, fact, 10 things that you've done wrong in your life until now, really clickable messages because it, it taps onto our emotion of not really being on top of all this information that's there. So the box turner, where does that word come from? Uh, Yes, good question. It comes from um, consumer research. So the old consumer, um, part of the major generations in Finland actually. So people maybe slightly above my age, um, the boomers, the baby boomers, or even to some degree, the Gen Xs. Um, when there's a marketing message or a communication message aimed at them, 
they pretty much think that they have already been pre-selected for the message and they they receive it in the sense that you advertise okay this is a new oatmeal thing and uh, you've got now two percent less sugar and they're like okay fantastic i'm shopping something that has less sugar but not so with the younger generations they are what we call box turners meaning that they see the same uh two percent less sugar advertising on the oatmeal but what do they do they take the box and they box turn and they start reading the little print in the behind in the, in the back side of the box and uh, in that sense they find want to find out what the claim is based on now anybody on the on, online who helps you with such kind of understanding that the small print reading the reality behind something is very influential Anybody who supports your views or my views, we think it's important. It comes from the cognitive biases that we have. Anybody who provokes positive emotions, as we're bombarded by lots of negative information and that's a, lots of news that are taking an emotional toll on us, sometimes just being able to produce a positive emotion is very influential. And I think this is something that uh, when you hear a bit later on from Kati, from the tax industry in Finland, I think this is something that is made their majorly tapping into. Now, anybody who helps you belong or makes you feel like you are part of a group or a society is also very influential. And if you're looking at why some hate speech, for example, activates online, it could be that it's just easily available and it supports your views and it provides some positive emotions, even though it seems counterintuitive to those of us counterintuitive to us who are not part of that group, but it might help them belong. These could already explain some of the reasons why some people are influential in this kind of environment. So this is from a book called Measurable Communication that we published together with Elisa Juholi a couple of years back. And uh, I've amended it a bit since its publication. So there's new bubbles, the purple bottle bubbles in the, in the left-hand side are new. And we're looking at all the different forms of media arenas that there exist for corporate communication today. Now, at the top, you have the green ones. So you have the earned media, this is the very popular one. So the journalists making stories, you have the paid media, so advertising, you have owned media, so your corporate websites. And then, in addition, we have some newer ones. So we have the advocated media, meaning employee engagement or whatever they're doing, employee advocates. We have the shared media, whatever can be found in people's social media posts, for example. We have the searched media, whatever can be found in search results. And then there is the brand, a, a bunch of new ones that we could even discuss whether they are real media, but we think they have a, a specific role and they're a, a specific logic to them. So virtual media, of course, this would be some sensations that you can uh, achieve in virtual reality. Hijacked media, where you actually borrow somebody else's case and write on that and hijack the whole discussion or conversation from its original purpose. And then we have the mind media, and this is especially uh, familiar to those uh, who've worked with uh, investigative journalism, meaning all the different data available that can be collected from an organization and put together in favorable or unfavorable ways to answer questions that previously we couldn't answer. And then we have the rented media of influencers, so video bloggers, uh, bloggers who already have an audience. And I think one of my um, discussion points today is that when you're thinking about public sector communication, traditionally we're talking about websites or stories and ed editorials. But for all communication today, this is a very narrow take on it. There is so many other fields that should be considered and sometimes issues and ideas actually jump from one area to another. So for example, there can be an employee sharing a story that gets up, gets picked up by search uh, and through search engines by, by for example, um, emphasized by some advertising and then an influencer picks it up and then it goes to the earned media. So it, it just bounces around whatever is happening. And in that sense, when you're thinking of how to develop, um, like whom to reach and, and what media to use, I think, Lots of organizations should be thinking a bit broader than they are at the moment. 
With that said, I am also a realist in the sense that you can't have a fantastic campaign and then um, not have the resources to maintain it. So whatever you do start using, it does mean that you will actually end up having the, the stakeholders expect you to do it again. So in that sense, take on only those areas or arenas that you can maintain. But then what's the role in this foam environment? What's the role of everybody who's working in communication? The big argument here is that actually it is the role of organizational communication or, or public relations or whatever you choose to put here, strategic communication or corporate communication to maintain the organization's intangible assets. So there are special functions that maintain assets of the organization. Yes, there's HR that looks into the human capital. Yes, there is uh, other departments that all have their specific points of view. But for communication departments, my suggestion is that it is intangible assets that matter the most. And uh, that said, the cultural settings of each organization are very different. So a way of uh, benchmarking the best practices from one specific field doesn't always work because it was created or it, it, it functioned well in one certain environment, but not necessarily Every, every other environment that there is. And when I say cultural setting, I don't mean just national culture. There are several different layers of culture um, that are not just isolated through national borders. But I say intangible assets, and you may ask, what exactly do you mean by them? Well, here is several of these that actually we um, draw together in this book on public sector communication and we categorize them into three. So there is uh, those intangible assets that are organizational knowledge based, meaning that uh, no matter what the stakeholders think, this will be an asset if the organization wants to build it. So an organizational culture is something that organizations can really build by themselves. You can make sure that people are feeling good and collaborating. And this is an asset that's very valuable because it will often help you recruit, help you tempt the right kind of um, collaboration and even uh, sometimes tempt the right citizens and tempt the citizens to, to collaborate when needed. Then we have the citizen experience based. And here we have satisfaction which is something that, yes, the organization has something to do with it, but it's actually just based on the citizen experience. If they are having a bad day, it doesn't matter how fantastic the organizational service is, it's probably not going to really shape their satisfaction that much. And then we have several that are collaboration based. So we have engagement and social capital. And these are two that are actually formed in the process of collaboration. And then there are several that come as mixed ones. So for example, reputation we see is as a something that comes from experience and organizational behavior. Intellectual capital we see as something coming from just organization knowledge with collaboration. And uh, legitimacy we see as something coming from collaboration and experience. And then in the middle of it all, there is trust. Now, yes, I'm aware that this could be spin in a different way and you could argue that in certain cases for example legitimacy would be really relying on knowledge or or so and these are not totally isolated this is just a simplification model just to start the discussion on who can shape what and what are the areas that uh, you can actually build by yourself and what are the areas where you need citizen experiences so if we're talking about citizens and their satisfaction levels you always have to realize that they are coming from their individual needs and they might not actually be the same needs that the organization is thinking that their needs are. Let's move on. In this uh, environment, some of the theories that we're seeing coming out now emphasize the fact that issues 
are actually central to how people discuss and how they form their opinions. I like to think of the organization, whether this is public or private or NGO, it's kind of a, a little battery. There are some people that are positively drawn to you in a way that you're kind of having a positive vibe about your organization before you've even done anything. It's just a positive vibe. And then there are other groups that really don't like you or your organizations or, or even the public sector at large. And this is before you've done anything. So there is a positive spin and a positive uh, feeling among some people who just feel good about your organization. And then there is a negative spin for some people who just feel bad about your organization, no matter what's happened in the past. And around these groups, uh, I call the negative, negative uh, organizational stakeholders, I call them hate holders. And then the positive ones, I call them faith holders because they support the organization. Between these two groups, there are issues that they take part in. Often it is um, in the sense that they are isolated, that the faith holders seldom mix with the hate holders. They seem to be in different categories, but there are issues that touch both groups. And then there are also issues that actually touch uh, fake holders, meaning stakeholders who are actually fake, who don't really uh, have either substance or don't really have individual people behind them, but are artificial ways of influencing or appearing to have influence on something, such as buying fake followers or signing fake petitions or, or something like that. But the argument here is that the citizen bubbles are not just citizens collecting together with their friends or citizens deciding to uh, help the public sector and, and collect a group and just ask the public sector, what can we help with? But it's often instead formed around an issue that they're interested in. So in this bubble environment, the bubbles in the dishwashing foam actually cluster together according to certain issues and topics. Well, I mentioned earlier that there's expectations that um, are formed whenever public sector does something. And this might be actually true for industry, any industry that, that uh, deals with individuals. And when it comes to understanding how citizens or, or stakeholders or, or customers feel about this, there seems to be two different logics. And I call them <laughs> Venus and Mars logic. If we start with the citizen expectations, what are they like today? Uh, increasingly also for public sector, they are that you get real-time service. If you can get real-time service from Amazon, why not your tax office? If it's personal at uh, your K market, where they know whatever you're, you're waiting to be on sale, why couldn't it be personal at your, your, your ministry level uh, service of, of social uh, or health issues? Citizens are expecting targeted information. They don't want to have everything available to them. They want hand-picked. So whenever I need to renew my boat license, I need to know where to get it. And I need to get that information nudged to me the week before it's due. Citizens, I think, are more issue-centric in the sense that they have topics, they have uh, questions that they want to discuss. They are looking for answers instead of uh, understanding the construct or looking at the process in itself. They're very attitude driven in the sense that uh, whatever they feel is worth their value and whatever they think is important in society at the moment, then they participate in that. And they're very much relying on perceptions. So not necessarily experiences, but perceptions of what seems to work and what they have heard is not working. Now, if we compare that to the organizational logic, it seems that organizations are very often um, process optimized in the sense that they are developed, developing very well, you know, which message gets from which department to another and how to do this efficiently as possible. But sometimes uh, the out individual who's being served is left out of the process. The organizational logic is all about making guides, guidelines and policies that are generalizable in the sense that you don't have a specific answer for every single citizen, but you just have generalized thinking in that sense. 
it's all about priorities. You can't really do everything. You can't exactly serve everybody. So who are the things and what are the issues that we prioritize at the moment? It's very factual in the sense that there's not strong emotional um, discussion often in the public sector. And it's based on, uh, or it's, it's, it's collecting around policies and politics in the sense that it's, it's related to what the politicians say, what's on the agenda, and it's really relying on how things are best done in the sense that there are policies to follow and this is the way to, to handle things. And when I look at some of the organizational logic, um, how individuals there behave, it's very much on uh, focused on uh, responsibilities. So what is our responsibility and what is not our responsibility and how can we um, actually you know, make sure that nobody uh, accuses us of not doing our responsibilities, especially in Finland, it's, it seems to be a very heavy load in that sense. So to give you guys an example, uh, when there was the first, um, uh, the THL, the local health authority, who was giving some information about the COVID case in, in February, in, I think it was March, 2020, this year earlier, um, their um, chairperson, he actually started with explaining to the citizens what THL is, what are their responsibilities, what kind of policies they do, what are their priorities, and who is what kind of departments they have and who is working on what. And at the same time, the citizens were looking for answer to the question, what's going to happen to me? What should I be doing? And it was a kind of a clash. Um, they, there is a very high level of trust in many of the Nordic societies. So in that sense, even when I say there was a problem, it means that there was a minor complaint by someone. There is not really a huge problem in that sense, if you think internationally or compare internationally. But let's see. I would say that when we're looking at the citizen form, there is a different logic to it when we compare um, what public sector communication, for example, used to be years ago. So when we're thinking of arenas, I would, instead of just looking at where people are collecting or where they're talking, I would look at issues. What are they talking about? When we look at what drives them or what you know, gets them going, I would look at emotions. And instead of thinking, uh, how can we measure all that they're doing? I think attention of being paid or being available or answering is already a value in itself. So attention actually, just gaining somebody's attention in this kind of phone society is, is currency in itself. And box turning actually is a means of how to get people involved and engaged in the sense that um, there are several issues that every single organization is um, or might become the victim of box turning. So if you think about what in my organization are people most complaining about, or what are the things that individuals often get wrong or they misunderstand, those might actually be topics that somebody is able to box turn in the future. And my thinking is that organizations should be doing it themselves. So box turning your challenges before somebody else from the outside does it. People like me are influencers, so not necessarily the, the rich and the famous. And communication in this environment becomes more about explaining the issue and telling the story. So narratives in that sense. And I think expectations are now the new starting point in the sense that this shapes what kind of reputation, reputation you develop, this shapes whether you're satisfied or not, what kind of legitimacy is developed because expectations set you up for better or for worse. But if you want to continue with uh, these topics, here are two of our newest books, Public Sector Communication and the Handbook of Public Sector Communication out now by Wiley in the last few years. And I think we have plenty of time. I would next turn over to Kathy for some comments. And I've asked her to introduce herself and the tax office that won this program prize. I think it's, it's a fantastic job that they're doing. So over to you, Kathy. 
Okay, thank you, Vilma. It was a marvelous presentation, and I, I feel pressure how to comment. But um, my, um, some, just some point of views. My uh, Vilma's presentation was so modern as well. She had Prexi or some Prezi or something like that. I have old-fashioned PowerPoint, which I'm not operating even myself, but Frederick is helping me. Thank you. But anyhow, uh, my presentation is also very practical. But I, I found there were many, many things that Wilma said that I, I found very familiar. Yes, this is true. Yes, we do that and so on. And maybe we, uh, as, as being nominated, had this prize. Maybe we have done this um, by, by ourselves a longer period, and that's why we are here today. But I, I just thought that I comment on Wilma's uh, presentation during I just tell what we are we are doing what what kind of what are we thinking about the communication as a civil servants public sector actually after the prize I, I i wrote a blog it's in finnish but anyhow i wrote a blog what are the differences between this public sector and and uh, private sector communication and so on and i i hardly find any differences it's 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 like the same Vilma started with this so that's why i mention it now but anyhow, yes, we can we can go on. Frederick can show this because um, yeah, about some words about me. I have been working as a communication director less than two years, but anyhow, almost two years in in the at the Finnish tax administration. And uh, be, but before that, I was working uh, in in the Finnish Center for Pensions, which was which was mandatory pension system earnings based in Finland, and it was sort of public sector, even though I wasn't civil servant. But I, I worked there over ten years, so I have I have experience that I can say, and uh, that's I'm gonna go through in this in in this um, presentation as well. Okay, I've told that my I have. I have Swedish as well as a home language, and that's why I'm a Finn speaking. And the, when I, when I think it's a, when I speak with a different languages, I always say something in Swedish. But it doesn't matter here because I think the majority is is Norwegian here. I think so. And I love Nordic countries. I have to say, and I so admire Vilma as well. But I, I admire uh, Norway and Nordic pe no, no people in Norway really much. So it's nice to be here. And I love a Eurovision song because this, this is really important in this context. Okay, let's go on. <laughs> can see. Okay, yeah, this is a picture taken from uh, three decades back, 30 years back ago. So this is this might be the image which uh, still some people in Finland have about this Finnish Finnish tax administration. Uh, this is the picture. Yes, it was. Um, this was the moment that people had their own percentage, uh, tax percentage, and that they wanted to queue for this for office, and it took ages before they got in. And after that, we have developed, uh, we have services and so on. This is not the reality anymore. But some people may think that we can surprise them being communicative and and with helping them in in various ways because they think it's it still is like that. But I wanted to show this picture. I think it's quite funny. But we can go on. But this might be the image still. All right, so to, to start with, Vilma was talking about these bubbles and you have fantastic terms, you had everything I wrote down. Sorry, I have to check because I have my notes here. Faith holders and hate holders and box turners and everything. But um, we do have this all the same and the, and the uh, atmosphere is pretty much the same all over in the world towards uh, taxes, but but we in Nordic countries and we in Finland, we have fantastic base where we can lean on and, and where we can have our communication and we, we can try how to communicate because we have these um, um, surveys about our attitudes in Finland and, and people in Finland in general feel that paying taxes is an import, important civil duty. And uh, this is like North Korea, 98% of the population thinks pay, paying taxes is important in order to maintain our welfare share. And, and people think 78% of the, of the citizens, they feel that they get good value for, for that they pay. So that's, that's uh, how is it possible? And uh, Wilma had some vac vaccination uh, material 
I've read before her presentation now, but I didn't hear it today that much, so I'm not going to comment on that. But it, it raised me some uh, some questions about uh, that it would be quite healthy every now and then think about such things that uh, are there some things we should should warn about the citizens and, and so on. But we can go on here as well. Okay, I have to just show the, our strategic objectives. This is Finnish uh, uh, tax administration. So this is so simple. But do you know what? Every, I'm, I would say almost every day we just go back to our values when we do our communication acts, so to say, and and we we just check if this uh, list our 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 objectives are fulfilled. In every uh, in every communication act we do, it's simple. Of course, we have to ensure tax review, and and we should uh, see that the fair tax assessment is is uh, is uh, live and a positive taxpayer experience. If they would feel like that, so we are happy, and they are happy, and everybody is happy, and we can ensure the tax review and so on. So the, these are quite simple, but we check them. Okay, this check check check. Is this true? Yes. We can go on. I think there's something about, uh, well, may, maybe not of our values, but but I would like to say that one value we have, it's quite common. I think every organization or, or many organizations have one have a value value which is called trust. So do we. But but in our organization, we leave uh, we leave this value trust. Uh, it's alive every day because in uh, our organizational culture is like that that for example our directors they trust on us our special our specialist they trust on us they they trust on that that they we know as a communicators what we do so we don't check the, the our our messages through the organization and, and ask for permission we can ask for about a bit, uh, ask for sorry <laughs> after that, but not not like that. That they trust on us, and we trust them, and we can we can have content which is maybe not so traditional for civil servants and for any other other organizations as well. But here you can see well we have quite we have the of course Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. That's nothing uh, nothing special. But we really are active and we are communicative and we help taxpayers to succeed. We, we, active, we have interaction in, on our channels. And Vilma mentioned something here I thought I could in her presentation. Yeah, about this, you had a marvelous picture with uh, three balls, this organizational knowledge base, com knowledge base and citizen experience based and so on, based and so on. And I thought we have done a massive job to, to get rid of this organizational based communication. And we have audience based communication, I would say. And it's not easy having um, such a uh, big authority like a uh, tax authority, tax administration, uh, and all the specialists we have, we have to, inside our organization, we have to show this, that every, every information is as value as, as the other one is. So we, we, as a communication specialist, we have to do the decisions and we have to say that no, people don't have to know this, these things. No, we concentrate on that. And it's not easy always, but you are a communication specialist, you know it, but we have courage to do it. And that's maybe because we have trust in our organization, very high valued. Okay, yes, being a mate, so Vilma, uh, Vilma explained something about these bubbles that uh, you, you didn't use a way, uh, use a word friend maybe, but I, I think a lot about our audiences and our our stakeholders and so on because we have a quite big um, group of people what, who really admire us and that's uh, that's confusing. They can call to, call to us. They can write to us. Wouldn't you have any any anything we could buy your socks or ties or something like that? We would like to wear because we love our tax administration. And I think it's strange. 
but anyhow, uh, being a friend, I don't know. We don't try to be friends, but we try to communicate with them and we try to uh, uh, product uh, some kind of content they can use because what's the point to make some kind of, co co kind of communication contact that nobody cares about or uses. We have opened our, for example, our Instagram to, uh, to, sit to the citizens, they can send us for example, some videos we do. We did um, a playlist because people are quite anxious. Some people are quite anxious to wait their own tax, for example, tax cards. They are, of course, electronic nowadays, but anyhow, and they start to call us and, and so on. We did, we did some uh, playlist, some music. We took um, 80, 80s uh, coverage, uh, pan, pan fluid. What is pan, pan, huilu, pan? you know the oldest take my breath away with pan fluid and so on and and people started to do some videos to us that started to send some just funny things and we published published them all and we did a com uh, competition of them and them and, and and it was really funny and then we thought okay we are the first civil servant um, in in Finland, who opens their old channels to the citizens, and it was quite a, it was crazy, but it was quite a good thing. And there, in behind, was was the strategic uh, goal as well. Yes, we go on. That's true. Okay, I just wanted to show that our general directors they they are quite easygoing and people. And I I thought you know which and you like um, people you like skiing. So I wanted to just show that the general direction. Uh, di directors of, of Finnish tax administration and and the other uh, other administration wanted to ski, they they promised to ski if we can have many many people many citizens they will change the letters to the electronic communication uh, channels so that was I was just wanted to show that so in Finland maybe this thing is the same in Norway that general director can be an an ordinary guy, and actually, for example, they both both do. But the, but our general director, Marco Heikura, he's he's quite active on Twitter, and he can answer the questions, and he can discuss, and so on. Maybe I don't know if it's with his own face and as himself. And I think it's really great. Maybe he can call me sometime. Kati, what would I what would I write now? But he does it all all by himself. It's great. Yeah, we can go on. Huh? this yeah okay we even uh, we even go abroad we, we try to we try to tell to to the foreign uh, business firms that Finland is the happiest country not because we laugh at all, at all the time but because everything works and and this is uh, this is largely because of our taxes this might be bold to some some opinion but we have had quite good success in China for example and now we try to do it in other countries as well. Maybe you can show the next picture with the China. We were attending China slash previous years and year and last year we tried. We have done it. Uh, we have had done that. If there weren't uh, Corona, if if you can see the, that show the next picture. It's um. Yes, this is picture from slash Shanghai 2019. But the um. There you can see, uh, maybe we take the next picture because I, I just love these slogans we have. Yes, there that you can read our slogans. And this is one secret, we don't try to be different from what we are basically. We are civil servants, we are administration, we but we promise you that we are a true friend to you. We will help you. But this is to the companies, but we have the same tone of voice when, when we uh, talk with the citizens. And I guess this Vilma was talking a lot of citizens, but I just wanted to show you that we, I think we are quite bold. And this is something that interests the foreign countries as well. But what Finnish tax administration does this, why? But we usually answer when people are asking why are you doing this, we answer why not. Is there another picture, some slides as well? Yes, this is this is a picture that maybe uh, Vilma with colleagues would like to have a look in, in 
some just some minutes if we still have time but this this is something we have achieved all by ourselves we communicators my colleagues this is our sense of content and um, there you can see the the boldness uh, which i mentioned that we are quite bold as well but the and the, the, this is the one um public is delighted when we do something they don't expect us to do but nowadays they can expect that, that we can do many things but that's why we we have written it down and between the uh, strategy and a public there's the creative creativity which we use quite ah uh, quite quite a lot and as I told you, one reason is that because we don't ask permission, we, we just test, we try, if, if, if we test things, if, if, if it works, then it's good. And it's, it often, often works. And empathy is one, one important issue. Maybe you can look at this later on if you are like, because this material is here. But anyhow, I haven't told you all the, all the things we have done. We have done so many things, but for example, something was it started two years back. It started that we start to whisper all the tax or some tax information because the ASMR, these um, whisper, whispering tax information, it's good to your brains and so on. And it was a massive success. And we did uh, when Banks ripped off his, his art, piece of art, we, we ripped off our tax card in the same way and we ended to. American uh, magazines and so on. What is this Finnish tax in administration does these things? And we have dog puppies who have helped to people relax when they have to do some tax, du tax duties, fulfill their tax duties. And um, I told you about the, the pan fluids and, and so on. So people are often surprised and then they, then because they are surprised, we don't want to surprise them for that only, but they just remember, okay, I have to do that and I can do that. I have to do my tax duties and they make these things easy for us. We got a lot of feedback that, okay, we, we are not afraid of you anymore. And that's, that's uh, important as well. All right, I think I've used my time. Did I have any other pictures there? Well, it's uh, some listing. Okay, this, this is a secret behind the nomination, but these are quite fami familiar things to communication specialists, but it's a list you can look through. And I try to think about if there was something about I could comment on Vilma's presentation at the same time. Don't worry, Kathy, I think you've done enough commenting on my yeah. stuff. Oh, okay, thank you. And, and you can... Uh, all, can put the questions maybe I can comment a lot of yes but that was about this about us was yes because time is running and I'm sure you want to ask some questions super thank you thank you Kati I think it's it's really unique when you think about uh, public sector communication and what you guys are doing and I'm actually surprised that there was not a backlash in the sense that people would start to oppose you and that it would shape your credibility. Because mm. sometimes when you are doing things that are unexpected or outside your usual way of behaving, it, it's, it messes up with the trust. So I'm, I'm curious, how do you make sure that it doesn't mess with the trust? Well, I think we can be... Uh... We can surprise people, we can be funny even, and so on, because we always have this message bef uh, behind uh, everything we do. And, and, and one secret is that our services, not, not communication services, but tax services, people for citizens to, and, and, and for, for business also to fulfill their tax duties, they, they are working, they are functional. They are quite good, so. Mm -hmm. It's behind that. that. And, and it's the way. We, we didn't just start to be, okay, now we start to be funny because we do have in Finland, we have other experience when people try to, to when, when organizations try to be, okay, well, no, now we are going to be funny. So it doesn't work. And we're, for example, this whispering, the tax information, this, this you have to your tax percentage. Then, some, then some, after that, some 
was it fat zero or some big big uh, companies try to do the same thing that people are no don't do that tax uh, tax administration did it already and they did it much better so who so it's it's amazing how the support is there but of course i've been i've been horrified many times that okay now the people are going to be angry but it hasn't happened yet not much of course we have also this hate holders and, and not everybody loves their taxes and and so on of course but the big picture is is quite positive mm-hmm. but there's a question about the happy taxpayers in finland so Lars is asking, has it been made normative campaigns to create that value or has it just occurred over the years? Well, I would say it has, it has, has just occurred over the years and it's, it's a long, long journey. It started from the, huh, started with the internet, believe me or not. So we, st- we, we started to build the services to the people, the citizens and, and, and so on. So it's a long journey. And our attitude, this organizational-based communication, we have in our administration, the uh, audiences and our clients are very high valued. It's it's a it's unwritten uh, value behind everything we do. Okay, we haven't been that thirty years back or twenty years back, but almost like ten ten years back. So it's it's a question of the whole organization, not only communications, because mm-hmm. you can't, you have to be what you are. It's mm-hmm. honest, maybe. Mm-hmm. I'm very fascinated by that, Kati, that you guys did first that that whispering trend. For those of you who have no idea what we're talking about, it's it's one of the forms that uh, actually some people fall asleep to it, don't they? They listen to videos that are being whispered, and it calms them down. So it's a whole genre of whispering something. And I'm really surprised that there was a backlash for some big business doing it and you guys doing it first and doing it better. Do you think it comes from the fact that taxes are a negative thing? We were talking about how everybody who causes positive emotions is actually influential. Hmm. So what do you think? What, what's the role of taxes being a negative thing and then you doing positive things to kind of fix that negative feeling? Mm. Well, it might be it might be that that it can surprise you, and that's a good factor. Uh, mm. It it might be one uh, answer to that, but 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 um, well, as I show you, the um, taxes are negative things. But we we here in in Nordic countries, I, I guess it's pretty much the same in Norway. We can we don't love taxes, but we understand them mm. quite a lot. We understand what 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 we can achieve to paying taxes and so on. This is a good base, of course, yes. And what about, and, and this, maybe the, one more thing, we, our ideas come in-house, mostly, most of them. We use quite a little, you know, the, uh, um, some some uh, public um, or some other other organizations, not organizations, but um, what is minus, to Mr. Vilma, help me. Uh, yeah, yes, 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 advertise, yes, advertising agencies, quite a little, and, and it's, not, it's not a principle, but we, have had, we, we are so lucky, we have people who are so creative, and they, are, they can be crazy, and uh, for example, me as a, as a communication director, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to know everything they are doing, I, they just tell me if they think that I should know. Of course, I'm with them and I, I'm I'm creative as well and so on. But I understand that I'm not the stakeholders. I'm not the audience in any every channel and so on. And, and I can't I can't say I'm not the one who has the wisdom. No, let them do and let them try. Mm-hmm. I think that's so, an amazing attitude. Yes, I'm, and, and, and that's that was the one, one thing that people maybe know that we are real. We are just what we are. For for example, the wisp whisperer guy he was an ordinary civil servant from the middle of Finland and he's our epic tax guy as well now we have these gifts with epic tax guy and so on we have ordinary people and our ideas are quite ordinary so these are employees and not just the communication department coming up with these no not just you know and we got many ideas we got from the our customers from, from mm-hmm. the citizens, some are, yeah, yes, yeah, from mm-hmm. the middle of Finland. Okay, you should maybe do this. And wow, what a crazy idea! Let's try. 
<laughs> they wow. are participating. Yeah. And for example, these videos they sent us with this 80s cover cover <laughs> songs with, and it was, uh, they were so crazy. We wouldn't have done them by ourselves, that, but. So how can we find these online, Kati? If we go to YouTube, do we find them if we search for Vero Hallinto? Yes. Or where do we find it? And Instagram is Vero Hallinto. Twitter, Vero. I could add the, a list if somebody is interested. There were some videos in my presentation. and Oh, there were the addresses as well. But if you are interested, you can check. And you can all, always contact me, for example. It's, I will be glad to help you. Sure. I think it's getting close to 2 p.m. in Finland, so 1 p.m. in Norway. So I think I will turn it back to Alex, who's going to say something about the coming webinars that are coming ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Vilma. Of course, um, th first of all, thank you both for uh, these excellent insights from public sector communications. Um, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, I switched rooms, so I wasn't 100% sure there. Um, I especially loved um, Kati's the, the tensions in your presentation also. I mean, you started with this uh, black and white picture, uh, the stereotype of the tax administration, uh, which almost gives you the chills, right? Not in a nice way. And then going to these more new, bold, creative ways of engaging with your stakeholders. I think that's a really nice contrast there in the presentation itself. Um, uh, just uh, to highlight again our next and last um, session, so next time we'll talk about crisis communication, Nordic perspectives uh, on the COVID crisis, on uh, potentially sort of Nordic particularities of managing crisis through communication with colleagues from Denmark and Sweden. So thanks again for our Finnish uh, colleagues today, and I look very much forward to uh, seeing uh, some of you again uh, in the webinar in uh, later later this November. Until then, bye bye.